after, we're going to have a sunrise service and then a 9.30 service and an 11 o'clock service. Okay, so look in your bulletin for all of that. All that information's in there. I, I want to encourage you to invite people to Easter. We have these invitations. They're on the black table right back there. Take some, pass them out to your family and friends. We want to celebrate the resurrection. We want to do it with a lot of people. And if you have not served on a team yet, then Easter is a great day to do that, to get started doing that. You can put, fill out a Connect card and just say, I'm interested in serving, and we will get you connected to a team. Next week, we have a mission trip meeting. So we've talked about this mission trip that we are going on to Chattanooga, Tennessee. If you are interested in going or if you are interested in supporting those who are going, then attend this meeting. It'll be after service next Sunday, after service next Sunday in the fellowship hall. You can find out how to support those who are going or information about going. We collect an offering every year around Easter. It is called the Annie Armstrong Easter Offering. And this goes to missionaries, chaplains, uh, church planters, uh, things like that in North America. So I encourage you, pray about how you can give to this, what you can give to this. It is a way to support those who are doing an important work in our country, on our continent, actually. So the Annie Armstrong Easter Offering, you, you can also, uh, if you want to give a check, you can do that. Just make sure you say Annie Armstrong, or you can give online and select Annie Armstrong. Last thing, we are going to have a, an outreach opportunity at the Spring Festival for Freeport. That is coming up. It is going to be on the 8th, the day before Easter. So I encourage you to get involved. We're going to have two shifts, 8 o'clock to 12 o'clock, and then 12 o'clock to 4 o'clock. And we want a lot of people to come out and, and help. Uh, we want to engage our community so that we can share the gospel with them. If you are interested in serving on, on that, uh, participating in that, there are sign-up sheets on the black table right back there. You can sign up, or you can go to anchorfreeport.com spring and sign up that way. Myla uh, has more information. If you have questions, she is right here in the red shirt. All right, so that's all we got. Let us worship together. Thank you, Sean. Um, thank you so much for being here as we worship. I want to read this passage over you. This is from Colossians chapter 1. It's talking about Jesus. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him if indeed you continue in the faith stable and steadfast not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven of which i paul became a minister i paul became a minister we were once alienated hostile in mind ephesians 2 says that we were dead in our trespasses sons of disobedience and yet God in his great mercy reconciled us back to himself by the blood of Christ. So would you stand as we worship in that light today, singing of the great mercy that God has for us. Let's praise the Lord together. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more, stronger than darkness. New every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. Sing of His great love. What love could remember no wrongs we have done? Omniscient, all knowing, He counts not their sum. Thrown to a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness new every morn. Our sins they are many, His mercy is more. 
What patience would wait as we constantly run? What Father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morning. Worship Him for His kindness. What riches of kindness He lavished on us. His blood was the payment. His life was the cost. We stood neath the debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness and new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. he has shown us by giving up himself in Jesus. And so in response to that, we give our lives to him. We give everything we have for the sake of the gospel. So let's join the song we sung a couple weeks ago, proclaiming that we surrender to a God who is worth it all. My eyes are on the cross where you gave it all. I worship you. I worship you. I see the one who saves, the light of heaven's grace. I run to you. I run to you. And I, I surrender. I lay my life down at your God of mercy, you are worthy. I give you every part of me. The things that I have done and the things that I will do, I give to you. I give to you, holy God above, how could I resist your love? I run to you, I run to you, and I, I surrender. God of mercy, you are worthy. I give you every part of me. Worthy of every breath. With every breath, with all I am, oh Jesus, I surrender. My heart is yours, I trust you, Lord, 
everything you have for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for your singing. You can have a seat. We're going to pray together. We're going to pray for our time together and ask that God um, would bless the, the reading of his word and the preaching of his word. But here at Anchor, we also love to pray for other churches and ministries in our community and all over the world. So this morning, we're going to pray specifically for uh, Cross Point Church of Freeport and Pastor Sam over there just for the work that they're doing. Their mission is to connect people with Christ. And so we're going to ask God to bless them and their ministry. So would you join me in prayer? Jesus, what great truths we get to sing today. The love and kindness that you have lavished on us. The blessings and riches that you have graciously given us. And most of all, God, we, we thank you for our Lord Jesus, who what we just read in Colossians. Reconciled us back to you, God, by the blood of his cross. So we thank you for this great mercy that we get to sing about. And in response that we proclaim that we will surrender. We will be a people who give everything we have for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of others, that they would come to know and trust you, Jesus. And we pray that uh, for us. And we also pray that over Cross Point Church as they're meeting this morning and the, the services that they have. God, we pray that you would empower them by your spirit to, um, to fulfill the mission that you have called them, to make disciples among all nations. Um, and especially their immediate mission field here in Freeport. God, we pray that you would help them to fulfill their vision and mission to connect people to you, Jesus. And we pray for Pastor Sam as he preaches, God, that you would um, bless the words from his lips, help them to honor you and challenge and encourage their church. And we pray that, um, that many would come to know you because of the ministry that they are doing. And Jesus, we pray all this in your mighty name. And if you'd listen as I read from God's word, the 45th chapter of the book of Genesis, Joseph could no longer keep his composure in front of all his attendants, so he called out, send everyone away from me. No one was with him when he revealed his identity to his brothers, but he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it and also Pharaoh's household heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? They could not answer him because they were terrified in his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near me. And they came near. I am Joseph, your brother, he said, the one you sold into Egypt. And now don't be grieved or angry with yourselves for selling me here because God sent me ahead of you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there will be five more years without plowing or harvesting. 
God sent me ahead of you to establish you as a remnant within the land and to keep you alive by great deliverance. Therefore, it is not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler over the land of Egypt. Return quickly to my father and say to him, This is what your son Joseph says. God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me without delay. You can settle in the land of Goshen and be near me. You, your children, and your grandchildren, your flocks, your herds, and all you have. There I will sustain you, for there will be five more years of famine. Otherwise, you, your household, and everything you have will become destitute. Look, your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin can see that I'm the one speaking to you. Tell my father about all the glory in Egypt and about all you have seen, and bring my father here quickly. Then Joseph threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept, and Benjamin wept on his shoulder. Joseph kissed each of his brothers as he wept, and afterward his brothers talked with him. When the news reached Pharaoh's palace, Joseph's brothers have come. Pharaoh and his servants were pleased. Pharaoh said to Joseph, tell your brothers, do this, load your animals and go to Go on back to the land of Canaan, get your father and your families, and come back to me. I will give you the best of the land of Egypt, and you can eat from the riches of the land. You are also commanded to tell them, do this. Take wagons from the land of Egypt for your dependents and your wives, and bring your father here. Do not be concerned about your belongings, for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. The sons of Israel did this. Joseph gave them wagons, as Pharaoh had commanded, and he gave them provisions for the journey. He gave each of his brothers changes of clothes, but he gave Benjamin 300 pieces of silver and five changes of clothes. He sent his father the following, 10 donkeys carrying the best products of Egypt and 10 female donkeys carrying grain, food, and provisions for his father on the journey. So Joseph sent his brothers on their way, and as they were leaving, he said to them, Don't argue on the way. So they went up from Egypt and came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan. They said, Joseph is still alive, and he is ruler over the land of Egypt. Jacob was stunned, and he did not believe them. But when they told Jacob all that Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to transport him, the spirit of their father, Jacob, revived. Then Israel said, Enough. My son Joseph is still alive. I will go to see him before I die. Genesis 50, 15 through 26. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said to one another, If Joseph is holding a grudge against us, he will certainly repay us for all the suffering caused him. So they sent this message to Joseph. Before he died, your father gave a command. Say this to Joseph. Please forgive your brothers, transgression and their sin, the suffering they caused you. Therefore, please forgive the transgression, the transgression of the servant of the God of your father. Joseph wept when their message came to him. His brothers also came to him, bowed down before him, and said, We are your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You planned evil against me. God planned it for good to bring about the present result, the survival of many people. Therefore, don't be afraid. I will take care of you and your children. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Joseph and his father's family remained in Egypt. Joseph lived 110 years. He saw Ephraim's son to the third generation, the sons of Manasseh's son, Micah. Makir, okay, uh, were recognized by Joseph. This has always happened. Uh, Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will certainly come to your aid and bring you up from this land to the land he swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Joseph made the sons of Israel take an oath. When God comes to your aid, you are to carry my bones up from here. Joseph died at the age of 110. They embalmed him and placed him in a coffin in Egypt the word of the Lord. Thank you all for reading the word of God to us. 
We have been looking at the story of Joseph for the past several weeks, and the reason that we are doing this is because we want to see that the Bible is one big story, and there are little storylines within it, and all of those storylines point us forward to Jesus. So we have seen the good news of who Jesus is and what he has done, the gospel according to Joseph. So I, I want to recap really quickly what has happened so far in the story. Joseph is one of 12 brothers. His brothers hate him. He has this dream that his brothers will bow down to him, and they hate him even more. They hate him so much, they decide to kill him. So they beat him up, throw him into this pit where he can't get out. He will eventually starve to death, and then they change their minds. They sell him into lifelong slavery instead. Joseph finds himself in Egypt, the most powerful nation at the time, in the capital of Egypt. He is a slave there, and then he becomes a prisoner there until he interprets a dream for the king. And when he does that, the king makes him number two in all of Egypt, the second in command. He is overseeing this famine relief effort, rationing out food to different people. Thing is, the famine didn't just hit Egypt. It hit all nations. So people from all nations are coming to Egypt to get food. Joseph's brothers come to Egypt to get food, and they are asking him for food, not knowing that this is Joseph. They haven't seen him in 22 years. He looks like an Egyptian, not like their brothers. They have no idea. Joseph says, I will give you food if you go home and get the youngest brother and bring him here. So they go home, get the youngest brother. This brother happens to be Joseph's only full brother. The others were just half brothers. They bring him to Egypt. Joseph has them over for a meal couple things happen we're not going to get into right now uh, but then Joseph eventually as we saw reveals himself to his brother says I am Joseph I am your brother go home get dad move everybody here and I will take care of you they do that and then their dad dies so this is what has happened so far in the story of Joseph before we go any further let's pray father what an opportunity to open your word and to hear from you. We thank you for this privilege. I pray, God, in the time that we have together that you would focus our minds, that you would still our hearts so that we would hear from you. May your spirit move among us today. May we walk away changed. We ask this in your name, for your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. A man bought himself a bird. He didn't know it, but this parrot had been raised to just insult people and speak vile language to whoever he saw. So every time this guy would walk by the parrot, it would cuss at him. It would insult him. He tried to change things. It didn't change. So one day he comes home from work, and it's been a long day, and this parrot starts insulting him, saying bad things to him, and he's just had enough. So he grabs the bird, he throws it in the freezer, and he closes the door. For a few seconds, he hears that bird scratching at the door. He hears it squawking, flying around in the freezer, and then all of a sudden, it goes silent. The man thinks to himself, oh no, I've killed this bird. This is not what I meant to happen. I just wanted to teach it a lesson, but now it's dead. What am I going to do? So he opens the freezer, and he finds the bird sitting there calmly. The bird looks at him and says, my good sir, I fear I may have offended you with my rude language and actions. I will endeavor at once to change my ways. I ask you, good sir, please forgive me for what I have done. And the man is shocked, pleasantly surprised, but shocked. And he wants to know what changed in the bird. But before he can ask, the parrot asks him, may I ask, sir, what did the chicken do to you? <laughs> I thought it was a funny joke. <laughs> you know, sometimes we read sections of the Bible and we feel like they are very philosophical. They're just impractical. They don't affect our lives. And then there are other times that we read sections of the Bible, and they deal with something that we deal with every single day. As we look at Genesis 45 and 50, we are going to learn about something that all of us deal with regularly. We are going to learn about forgiveness. How can we forgive? Some of us have carried around grudges for 10, 20, 50 years Maybe this week someone wronged you in some way, said something that was rude or mean, and you have been struggling in your heart to forgive them. How can we forgive? When someone wrongs us, we sometimes want to treat them like that man treated the parent and teach them a lesson. Other times, in the darkest times, someone has done something really bad to us. Deep down in our hearts, we wish that that person may end up like the chicken in the freezer. 
How can we forgive? As we study this today, we are going to find that in order to forgive, we need to recognize two things. In order to forgive, we need to recognize two things. So let's start with the first. In order to forgive, we need to, number one, recognize your place. Recognize your place. In this chapter, we have the big reveal. Joseph shows his brothers who he truly is. And what do they do? Look at Genesis 45, verse 3. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But they could not answer him because they were terrified in his presence. Think about this situation. Joseph is in a place of power. He can do whatever he wants to his brothers. He could kill them right then and right there if he wanted to. There would be nothing to stop him. They recognize this. And they can't even speak because they are terrified of what Joseph will do to them in this moment. But that's not how Joseph views this situation. Look with me at verse 5. Joseph said, And now, don't be grieved or angry with yourselves for selling me here, because God sent me ahead of you to preserve your life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there will be five more years without plowing or harvesting. God sent me ahead of you to establish you as a remnant within the land and keep you alive by a great deliverance. Therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Yeah, sure, he is powerful. Joseph can do whatever he wants, but he recognizes something. He recognizes the truth that God was in control the whole time. That God had a purpose in all of the terrible things that his brothers did to him. That God was working all things out for good. Joseph recognizes his place. That he is not over everything. No, God is up over everything. He is ruler over everything. And Joseph is under God. He recognizes his place under God. Now, if you still have your Bible open, flip over to Genesis 50. Genesis 50. Verse 19, we, we see the difference this type of recognition makes. <clears throat> Genesis 50, verse 19, but Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You planned evil against me. God planned it for good to bring about the present result, the survival of many people. Therefore, don't be afraid. I will take care of you and your children. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. You see, these guys, they had done something to Joseph that was terrible. Something that required extreme forgiveness. And what Joseph does is he does not minimize their sin against him. He doesn't say, hey, I know that 22 years ago you thought you were selling me into slavery. Turns out those people who bought me, they just wanted a travel companion to Disney World. You know, that's where I've been hanging out for the past 22 years, just writing. It's a small world. That's probably not a good example because that may be worse than slavery. But anyway, he, he doesn't minimize what happened. Instead, he recognizes it, and still he forgives them. He, he thinks about everything that they have done, how they have stolen years from his life. And what does he do? He forgives them, and then he goes above and beyond. He provides for them and their children, and then he speaks to them kindly in order to comfort them. How? How could someone who was sinned against so badly be able to just forgive like that? Well, he tells us in verse 19, he asked, am I in the place of God? You see, Joseph recognizes his place, that he is not up here, that God is up here, and he is under God. And by recognizing that, it enables him to forgive. I know you struggle with forgiveness. I do too. All of us do things that people have done to us, ways that they have ruined our reputation, the the things that they have stolen from us, like our peace, what they have done to ruin our lives, we feel like, how they have crushed our dreams, how they have abused us. These things that people have done to us are terrible. And because of the weight of those sins against us, we don't know how we could ever forgive them. So how can we forgive? The only way that we can forgive is by recognizing our place. We are not in the place of God. 
We are not up here. God is up there. In fact, what the Bible tells us is we are in the opposite place, that we are sinners ourselves in need of forgiveness from God. The book of Colossians chapter 2 verse 13 says this, and when you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him and forgave us all our trespasses. He erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us and has taken it, taken it away by nailing it to the cross. Friends, do you see that you are a sinner that has been forgiven by God's grace? Do you see that you have been forgiven though you don't deserve it? Do you understand that you have been forgiven only because Jesus died in your place? See, your place and my place, it is not on the throne where we get to decide who receives grace and who gets a grudge instead. No, 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 God is in that place. What the Bible tells us is our rightful place is on the cross. But Jesus took our place so that we could be forgiven. And this is how that changes us. Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive person that you have refused to forgive, who did something unimaginable to you, who ruined your life, who dragged your name through the mud, who smashed your career, who broke your heart, that person that you don't want to forgive, you don't have the right to hold back forgiveness because you have been forgiven in Jesus. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. If we recognize our place, that we are sinners who have been forgiven by God's grace, then we will be able to forgive others. So number one, recognize your place. And there's a second thing we must recognize. In order to forgive, number two, recognize forgiveness has no limits. Look at Genesis chapter 50, verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, okay, that's where it starts. I can't count the number of times I heard growing up, Sean, don't hit your brother. Now, my most common response, whether it was true or not, was, well, he hit me first. To which my mother would respond, oh, if that's the case, continue on. Beat the snot out of him, Sean. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> She'd be mortified that I said that, actually. <laughs> no, it was always the same. It was, I don't care if he hit you, don't hit him. When we are sinned against, our natural reaction is to return the favor, right? to give them what they did to us. Well, that's not what we're supposed to do, obviously. This is what happens. Joseph's dad is dead, and his brothers are looking around going, "Uh uh-oh, this is bad. You know, dad's not here to protect us anymore. Dad's not here to say to Joseph, I don't care if they hurt you, don't hurt them. They are thinking, oh no, there is no one that is going to stop Joseph from getting even with us. And why wouldn't they think that? I mean, it's natural if you had been sinned against in that way to then sin against them in that way in return. So then we see Joseph do something radical. It would have been easy for him to get back with him. Again, his dad's dead. So his dad can't say, Joseph, here's my dream that y'all would get along, that y'all would love each other because we are a family. It would break my heart if you did something to them like they did to you. You know, there's no one there to say, hey, Joseph, this is not the wise thing to do. There's no one there to say, Joseph, this is against the law. If you do this, you're going to be in trouble. He was an Egyptian official. He could do whatever he wants to these outsiders. And he, on top of that, he could have been like, look, I did forgive you. But guess what? My forgiveness has run out. Do you think that was going to last forever? That's like a lifetime warranty on anything that you buy. When it breaks three years later, you find out it is not a lifetime warranty, right? It's a three-year warranty. And you're in year four. He could have said, my forgiveness has limits. And it has reached its limits. So now get ready for what is coming to you. You've enjoyed my forgiveness for 17 years. But now it's time to face up to what you have done. He could have limited his forgiveness. But what does he do? Look at verse 21. Therefore, don't be afraid. I will take care of you and your children. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them doesn't limit his forgiveness instead he gives them this outrageous forgiveness forgiveness we couldn't even dream of 
He blesses them. He comforts them. He cares for them. Why did he do that? He was showing us that forgiveness has no limits. Now, you may say, Sean, I I don't know anyone who would say, okay, I forgive you now, but in five years that forgiveness is going to run out. I don't know anyone that would say forgiveness has a shelf life, that it does expire. I certainly, myself, I don't believe that. I don't take back my forgiveness after a little while. Well, I bring this up because I think many of us, even if we don't recognize it, struggle with this. Let me ask you, how many times have you forgiven someone But down the road, you bring up this sin again and again in order to hold it over their heads. How many times has someone done something terrible to you? And the thought of what they have done weeks, years after they have apologized, when that thought comes into your mind, you get worked up and angry, and in your heart, you start sinning against them. How many of us have been sinned against in a terrible way, and we think to ourselves, "This, this is just too much? I can't forgive them. I can't just let this be. I, I got to hold on to this. Now, look, I'm not saying that there aren't, uh, there aren't penalties for what people do. I'm not saying that there aren't consequences for sin. There are. For instance, if your dad abused you growing up, well, guess what? He's probably never going to babysit the grandkids. He doesn't get that. There are consequences to actions. But still, we are called to forgive, to forgive in a way There are no limits, even though we put limits on it. Listen to this. When we think about how we could forgive, we need to hear this gospel truth from the book of Psalms. Psalm 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. And then Jeremiah 31, verse 34. For I will forgive their iniquity, and will never again remember their sin. Do you hear that? Do you hear what that forgiveness is like? God's forgiveness of our sin is limitless. He is saying that I won't even remember your sin. If God forgives that way, if that's what true forgiveness is, then we need to recognize forgiveness has no limits. And then we need to extend that type of forgiveness to others. If we have been forgiven in this way, then why should we limit our forgiveness to others? Shouldn't we stop limiting our forgiveness? Now, I know the the easy answer is to say, yeah, of course, Sean. But it's a lot harder to actually do this than to say it, isn't it? It's hard. It seems impossible, even. So how do we do it? Well, I remind you. If you trust in Jesus, the Holy Spirit is in you, and he is changing you to make you more like Jesus, which means he is helping you to forgive the way that Jesus forgives. You can forgive like Jesus because the Spirit of Jesus is inside you. Such was the case for a girl named Corey. She had been sinned against in a terrible way, a way that most of us could never even imagine. I'm going to read part of her story. Uh, She was a Holocaust survivor. Her sister died in a concentration camp. And she experienced the limitless forgiveness of God, and then it helped her forgive in this way as well. What I'm going to read is very lengthy. It's going to be several minutes, but stick with me, okay? Hear what she says. She says, It was in a church in Munich that I saw him, a balding, heavy-set man in a gray overcoat, brown felt hat clutched between his hands. People were filing out of the basement room where I had just spoken, moving along the rows of wooden chairs to the door at the rear. It was 1947, and I had come from Holland to defeated Germany with the message that God forgives. It was the truth they needed to hear most in that bitter, bombed-out land, and I gave them my favorite mental picture. When we confess our sins, I said, God cast them into the deepest ocean, gone forever. The solemn faces stared back at me, not quite daring to believe. There were never questions after a talk in Germany in 1947. People stood up in silence, in silence collected their belongings, in silence left the room. And that's when I saw him working his way forward against the others. One moment I saw the overcoat and the brown hat, the next a blue uniform and a visored cap with its skull and crossbones. He came back with a rush. 
the huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking naked past this man. I could see my sister's frail form ahead of me, ribs sharp beneath the parchment skin. Betsy and I had been arrested for concealing Jews in our home during the Nazi occupation of Holland. This man had been a guard at Ravensbrück concentration camp where we were sent. Now he was in front of me, hand thrust out. A fine message, Fraulein. How good it is to know, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And I, who had spoken so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled in my pocketbook rather than take that hand. He would not remember me, of course. How could he remember one prisoner among the thousands of women? But I remembered him and the leather crop swinging from his belt. It was the first time since my release that I had been face to face with one of my captors and my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk, he was saying. I was a guard in there. No, he did not remember me. But since that time, he went on, I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there, but I would like to hear from your lips as well. Frawling, again the hand came out. Will you forgive me? And I stood there. I, whose sins had every day to be forgiven and could not. Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply by asking? It could not have been many seconds that he stood there, hand held out. But to me it seemed like hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I ever had to do. For I had to do it. I knew that. The message that God forgives has a prior condition, that we forgive those who have injured us. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, Jesus says, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. And still I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands. And then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, with all my heart, I cried. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands. The former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. Forgiveness has no limits. Corey Ten Boom showed us this is true when she forgave the concentration camp guard who in some way contributed to her intense suffering and to the death of her sister, the way she was able to do that was by recognizing the limitless forgiveness she experienced in Jesus. Forgiveness has no limits. You see in the last part of the story of Joseph that in order to forgive, you must recognize your place you must recognize that forgiveness has no limits. The ending of the story of Joseph, as with all the other parts of this story, point us forward to our Savior. See, we have sinned against God. And though we have sinned against Him, though we have attempted to take His place as master of our lives, though we have stomped and trampled on the Creator's authority over us, out of love for us, He sent His Son. Jesus is perfect. He is sinless. He never did anything to deserve his death. Yet he sacrificed himself, dying in the place of sinners so that we could be forgiven. He took the punishment for our sins so that now we are forgiven children of God. If we trust in him, our sins are fully, completely, totally forgiven. Friend, do you see that Joseph's forgiveness of his brother's sin was nothing compared to God's forgiveness of our sin. Do you see that Corey's 
forgiveness of the concentration camp guards sin is nothing compared to God's forgiveness of our sin. We are forgiven. What a great truth. And so we are going to have a, a time of response. Maybe in response today, you need to ask someone for forgiveness. You have wronged them, you have sinned against them, and you have been too proud to ask for their forgiveness. Well, today you need to resolve to do that. You need to call them, meet with them, write them, whatever. You need to ask for forgiveness. As we have talked about this, maybe you think to yourself, I just have this guilt that I live with. You say, Sean, you have no idea what I've done in the past. You don't know the people I've hurt. You don't know the things I've been involved with. You can't imagine what I have said and what I have done to others. It is worse than you could ever know. And you think, I have to live with this guilt for the rest of my life. This is the burden I must carry for what I have done. It is a curse to me. And friend, I remind you, if you have faith in Jesus, you are forgiven. You are forgiven. No matter what you have done, no matter how bad it is, you are forgiven. Soak in that truth this morning. And praise God because you are forgiven. Maybe you need to receive forgiveness from God for the first time this morning. The truth is, you have sinned against him. You have lived for yourself instead of for him, just like I have. And there is punishment for your sin against God. And it will one day find you. But here's the good news. Jesus died for sinners. He took the penalty for sin so that we would not have to. So if you come to him and ask for forgiveness, you will be completely forgiven. You will not stand in judgment. Instead, you will stand as a child of God. The only way to experience true forgiveness is to come to Jesus. Put your faith in him. If that's you this morning, if you know that I'm talking to you, then you need to make this decision today. We're going to sing a song in just a minute, and as we sing, I invite you to come down. Let me pray for you. If you want someone to talk to, we'll be here to talk to you. If you have questions that you want to answer, we will try to answer those questions. Don't let anything stand in the way of trusting in Jesus today. And don't worry what anybody else is going to think. People are going to celebrate your decision to follow Jesus. And if you're too nervous to walk down by yourself, the person sitting next to you, I promise, will walk down with you. Come, receive forgiveness today. Or maybe today... You need to forgive someone. You have been holding on to something in your heart. You have let it consume you. Because that person did something to you, and they have never apologized for it. They have never tried to make up for it. Maybe they can't because they're no longer living. Or maybe they just refuse you. Friend, you need to forgive them today. If God has forgiven you of more than anything that anyone could ever do to you, then can't you forgive others? I know you say, Sean, but you don't know how hard it is. You don't know the pain that they have caused me. How on earth am I going to forgive them? The Spirit of God is working in you. And if you come to God and ask Him to help you forgive, He will do it. So today, forgive that person. Maybe as we sing this song, you need to come down and pray. Maybe you need someone to pray with you. Whatever the case, forgive that person today. Christian, you are forgiven because Jesus gave his life for you. Your sins are no longer held against you. Be reminded of this forgiveness and praise God for it. And then, forgive others as Jesus has forgiven you. As we sing, maybe you just need to pray where you are. Maybe you need to come down here and pray. Maybe you need to ask the person sitting next to you to pray for you. Let us respond to the gospel in this moment. So I'm going to pray for us, and then we are going to sing in response. Would you pray with me? God, it is so hard to forgive. People have done terrible things, God, 
and it hurts us, and it has scarred us, and it has affected us in ways we can't even express. So help us to forgive. Lord, you have forgiven us. Thank you. Thank you that you gave Jesus so that we could be forgiven. Now move in our hearts. May your spirit change us so that we forgive like you. Let this be for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Christ. So leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and train them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. up to our great and merciful Savior. Oh, what a Savior, isn't He wonderful? Sing alleluia, Christ is risen. Bow down before
Christ is risen. We bow down before Him, for He is Lord of all. Sing Alleluia. Christ is risen. Oh, The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with. The precious blood of Jesus Christ. Just up one last time, praising the Savior who gave himself for us, who reconciled us back to God by the blood of his cross. Oh, what a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? Sing alleluia. Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing alleluia. Christ is risen. You can have a seat. We are forgiven because Jesus gave his life for us. A regular practice that we have here at Anchor Church is, is called communion or the Lord's Supper. And is when we take the elements reminding each other and reminding ourselves of the sacrifice of Jesus. And as we do this, we remind each other also of the forgiveness that we have because of his spilled blood. So we're going to take communion this morning. This is something that is specifically for Christians. So if you do not trust in Christ, if you have not put your faith in him, we want you to respond in a specific way. It's just not through communion. We want you to respond by trusting in Christ this morning. So if you are a Christian, we ask that you do not take this. If, if you are a Christian, if you are following Jesus in obedience, if there is not unrepentant sin in your life, if you believe the gospel as you have heard it preached here today, we invite you to take it. So what's going to happen is our deacons will come up and they will pass out the elements. And just hold on to those. We are going to take them all together after they are all passed out. So I'm going to pray. The deacons are going to come up as I pray. And then we will receive the elements. Father, thank you. Thank you that we are forgiven. I pray this morning, God, that we would be reminded of this forgiveness as we take this meal. I pray, God, that you would strengthen our hearts as we take this so that we can forgive as we have been forgiven. Let this be for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name.
in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, it talks about communion and how, uh, how, what it means, how we should observe it. So this morning I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. It says, on the night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took the bread, and when he took it, he gave thanks broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So take now, eat, remembering the broken body of Jesus for us. Continues and says, in the same way, he also took the cup. And after supper, he said, this is the cup in in the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So take, drink, remembering the new covenant and the hope that we have. So we are going to close out the service. Kyle is going to close it out. We are going to recite the Lord's Prayer together. The words are going to be on the screen. I remind you, if you need prayer after the service, we have people wanting to pray for you standing by. Just come forward pray. Would you join me in standing and and we will pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy Thy kingdom kingdom come, thy thy will be done on earth as as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as as we forgive forgive those who trespass trespass against against us. And lead, lead us, us not, not into, into temptation, temptation but, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. Uh, we hope you have a wonderful afternoon, and we will see you.